but Jim and I go back actually a pretty long way. When I was a postdoc at Georgia Tech and, and Jim was just finishing, um, we tried to recruit him there and he went to work as a postdoc for Marshall Lynn and, and did work on WISE for, for many years after getting his PhD at University of Pittsburgh with Mickey Chi. Um, I think we have traveled in similar circles in the learning sciences for more years than I think we need to mention. Um, but I am absolutely delighted to have him here. Jim um, has recently has been at University of Toronto for the last few years, but just left and started at uh, Boston College, where he is serving as the Associate Dean for Research for 20 years. I guess you mentioned how long it's been. Um, he has led teams of students, designers, and developers who investigate new models of collaborative and collective inquiry in K-12 science. Um, his recent work investigated the pedagogical model known as knowledge, community, and inquiry that he's going to talk about so I'm not going to assume. Um, so I, I heard Jim give a talk at the early SIG in Belgium last summer and I said, oh, we really have to get Jim here to, to come talk about this. So. Um, Without taking much more of his time, I'm just really delighted that you are here, Jim, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks. We have at least one more seat. Okay, okay. hi, um, everybody. Yes, I am no longer from the University of Toronto, and I, I miss it. I want to go back. Um, <laughs> I want to start off by thanking uh, a lot of a lot of people more than or even on this slide, uh, teachers, students, technology designers, um, who are a group near and dear to my heart. Um, this is what we we used to look like. Uh, they're still back there, <clears throat> but I'm building a new a new group uh, in in Boston, and um, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to use some of the same slides that Cindy saw and get, so she can write her grant while I'm talking. No, no, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to try to talk quickly through the first bits. It, there's a lot of them. So, but it's partly so I can show up at the end bits without being way behind. So if I go kind of flying through some things, um, you know, there's there's the right readings you can read, and uh, you can sort of get the gist of of where it's all going. I want to. I want to talk about pedagogical models a little bit. This is uh, an over. This is a basically a, a, a steady theme in my last decade of work, which has to do with kind of specifying learning design and creating ultimately formalisms for articulating our learning designs. Because right now, the way that we articulate our learning designs is with paragraphs of written language, and that's a problem if you want to be a science and you want to talk about learning design and you want to embed your science in the learning design as an artifact of inquiry and you want to share that, this is what other fields have learned, like chemistry and biology. And biology still struggles, but you need formal descriptions and we need uh, to make progress on that. Um, in particular, I want to talk about collective inquiry. This is a new idea, relatively. Oh, it's probably not new. Nothing's new. Um, it's new for me. Uh, Anne Brown published uh, Fostering Communities of Learners in the kind of early to mid 90s, and it was revolutionary at the time. I think it remains revolutionary in the sense that it's not easy to turn uh, the institutions and the practices of uh, classrooms. But essentially, it has to do with turning the entire cohort of students in the class into the unit of learning. Okay, so for two, for typically, we would treat, I just mentioned this to half of you in the the, uh, <coughs> the apprenticeship course, but we would treat the people in our class as uh, they all enter with their own unique positions, their own unique experiences, interests, uh, affinities, and that would be a bug, not a feature. We would have to kind of lecture to the, the, the vector subtraction of that. We would have to sort of find where you all are and speak to that. And then we might differentiate how we talk to you and you. We might find opportunities that let you constructively build on where you're, where you're from. But in, in the learning communities, we actually try to turn that into a vector addition. We try to, to treat that as a feature, not a bug. We try to find ways to connect people with peers that are, uh, are well-suited for learning and to leverage the diversity in the classroom. So it's a tough order. Um, 
often you see in this work an emphasis on student contributed content. This is actually all very, very consistent with Web 2.0 and the kind of emerging social media that we are beginning to see. Wikipedia, uh, Facebook, and use it. All those were empty, right? <laughs> Before people put stuff into them. That's not the way it was 20 years ago, um, where we would create the content and you would take the content. Now you create the content and I find out what to do with the content. Fundamentally different way of thinking about learning content. Um, for me, these are collaborative uh, kind of learning opportunities where inside the learning community I build small group um, structures and I build opportunities for jigsawing and for kind of opportunistic assignment of materials and use of intelligence in the system. So I'll talk a little about that. You can imagine some of the challenges here. By the, by the way, I want to differentiate learning communities from knowledge building. You might read about both. I actually find similarities between the two, but they're, they're quite distinct. And some of the things I say about scripting and kind of creating curriculum would not fit the language of knowledge building, which is more about allowing the community to find what it's interested in and define its own progress. So that's a very viable community of research. Right now, Toronto is one of its centers. Uh, that's where I've been for 10 years, so I know I'm not, I'm not polarized to them, but I'm, I'm in tension with them. I have a, a more curricular view. I work in secondary science where we have to make progress on learning goals. Um, knowledge building has never worked in secondary science, for example, just saying. Okay. Um, so some of the challenges you can imagine, they're complex. There's, you know, you need to kind of address the uh, coverage. I think an important one for my work is that, that, that people come into the classroom holding their epistemic commitments from a lifetime. Even teachers who were students and had the experience of didactic presentation of content. And everyone's, you know, everyone can only build on what they know and where they've been. And that includes their ways of knowing and being together in a room of people. So here we all are. Okay? It's hard to turn that. And it's hard to change that. And so to research that, uh, this is like George Bush, it's hard. It's all hard. Uh, to research that means you really have to do a lot of work to address the epistemology of the people in the room, to give them icebreakers where they learn how to learn, that they could even learn in different ways. You have to work very carefully with the teacher to uh, make sure that the teacher is um, on board and actually sharing your epistemic commitments. Um, so scripting. In the literature of learning sciences, you might have seen uh, dis discussions lately on scripting and orchestration. Uh, Pierre Dillenberg, Frank Fisher, some of these folks are almost in a machine-readable type way. They're talking about uh, articulating the progression of learning that includes groups, materials, activities, conditions, pedagogical logic. You're going to work on this until you have met this condition, and then you are going to be regrouped, but that's going to be determined by these Boolean variables. and uh, orchestration has to do with making that actually fly. And everybody is, in, especially Pierre, if you know him, extremely committed to not over scripting. Not, you're not going to make everybody follow a tablet around and like do what they're being told and then learning happens, right? Orchestration of learning community, no matter how much you script it, really has a lot of what we call unbound variables. A lot of stuff happens and you, if you over script, it just goes completely. So you need to make uh, conditions and assignments that have a lot of uh, give and that even are not even fixed until certain things emerge in the context of the, the, the curriculum. So the design of a script can be uh, an art as much as a science. To address that, so I've tried to come up with a model. This is models have the boxes and the arrows. Um, originally motivated by a sort of a web two um, perspective. When I experienced Wikipedia, when I experienced these digital communities, when I experienced Amazon telling me what books I'd like to read, right, Wisdoms of the Crowd, um, I knew that this could be, have great implications for communities of learners in classrooms. I had read Ann Brown, she's never been replicated yet. But there's a new era of digital media and interactions around digital media that are upon us since the turn of the millennium. And there's an opportunity for Anne's work to take uh, great shape and to, to sort of be reinvigorated by these media, okay, as well as to progress on that work, because that's what a science should do. They should take the key ideas and they should 
act and produce off of them. So I'm, I'm actually in that vein. The model is called KCI, or Knowledge Community Inquiry. Basically, the, uh, the loops here are soft and complex and uh, kind of overlapping, but there's a, there's a collaborative knowledge construction activity. You might consider that as making a wiki uh, that populates a knowledge base. That knowledge base is indexed to the learning goals of the course. There are structured inquiry activities that we define that are uh, open, meaning you get to build what you want to build and you get to think and create. But they, uh, there are some rules and they, they sort of enforce headers on the page and you have to use the knowledge base and I'm going to actually digitally wire that in. Okay? So I'm going to use the technology to make it easier for all of us to do this very difficult kind of thing. Oh, and output. So when I design my inquiries, this is what a model does for us. It helps us. It gives us rules. Right? When I design them, they have to produce accessible learning outcomes on the standards that I'm supposed to meet. Okay. Oh, and I got two other things that I have to allow in. One is I'm not. I need the community to to decide what the themes are going to be and where we're really interested in. So I'm not allowed to fix my design completely because I don't even know who's who you are before you run it. And these things, the content expectations need to come in. Okay. So KCI, just a quick summary. Um, <coughs> There are epistemological commitments, obviously. So you start right off telling the kids, we're going to do this a different way. We're all going to learn together. You're going to need his stuff. And you better do a good job, because he's going to need yours. And you better hope he's doing a good job, because you're going to need his. But you give them examples of the Human Genome Project. You give them examples of uh, Wikipedia. And you help them understand that this is distinct. Okay. Um, there's a collective knowledge base that's built. There's these Inca projects, and I think I've done all that. Um, I defined it in terms of, I think it's four principles. That's numbers shifted around a bit. But, but essentially, these are assertions about what needs to happen. And for each of them, there are epistemological, pedagogical, and technological uh, dimensions. Okay, And I'm not going to have time to kind of go through all of those. But what they, what they shape up as is, for me, a design space or a set of design tensions <coughs> and for those of you who have uh, so for example if I put something really strong into the technology that actually has uh, tensions against both the epistemological commitments and the pedagogical uh, script and for those of you who are into activity theory this is in my mind close closely connected to how you can understand a community of learners in a technologically mediated uh, room is that there are rules, there are uh, objectives, and there and it is a kind of a uh, an activity system that is trying to make progress, and you can understand it that way. Um, so, for example, um, the technological scaffolds support the script. The pedagogical um, script instantiates the sequence, uh, and the epistemological commitment is declaring values for the quality of learning. So for each of those principles, I have uh, for, I have this defined those three elements. Um, the knowledge base serves as a resource and is accessible for editing improvement. And I'm I'm not uh, there's you know you can read more about this, but I'm going to have to keep moving if you want to see the good stuff of what we actually did with it. So I think the student learns also. I'm not a situated cognitivist in the sense that I don't even think about the student's individual trajectory. I think the student is actually, and my designs are engaging you against learning opportunities that I, I, I sort of see the world as a particle uh, bubble chamber where my job is to create fields for you and you're a particle going through them and you're going to come out with at least designed uh, energies along certain things. Any physicists in the room? <laughs> All right. So hopefully you at least uh, are interested and um, curious to learn more. The idea is that we want to create a model. We want to test this model. This becomes a research paradigm. This has been the paradigm of my research for the last eight to 10 years, um, trying to create, use this model to create curriculum, study that, watch it work, do analyses of students' epistemological beliefs, student learning, uh, teacher discourse the technological designs, this sort of thing. Um, these are typically substantial. Uh, it's not even worth it to me if it doesn't take, if it can't do a whole course with it. Plus, it's probably hard to do both ways. Right? So 
So typically they've all been semester long courses. They've all been co-designed with teachers. Uh, we've run, looks like about seven or eight of them. Actually, many more than that. Uh, well, no, seven or eight. And they've all typically been uh, deeply, deeply shepherded by one or more PhD students and technologists. So just, uh, I want to kind of run through a couple of early examples. This is from Jess Peters, who's now at SRI. She was a, the first one who actually did this, and we were asking, in her case, questions like, what does this even look like? What does this even look like when this is happening? Um, how do we do this? Uh, in, that, in the 2007, we didn't have the technologies we do today, but we did have wiki, and we did have um, uh, pretty good coders who could hack the wiki. So we came up with, uh, we worked with a great teacher, and just to kind of experience how this worked, we came up with the idea of a human disease curriculum. Okay, the teacher was, was uh, teaching something that, this was a, like one unit, I think it was, uh, it was actually short, um, four or five class sessions. And basically, we, she had five sections of the course, and we said, more the merrier. More the merrier. Let's have all five of them build this thing and see what happens. Um, so we created, uh, you know, count off by three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Ones are, are respiratory, twos are circulatory, threes are digestive. Now, go make a wiki, please. And do a good job, by the way, because they're going to need respiratory, and you're going to need digestive and circulatory, you'll see. Now, when you're going to go make a wiki page, we're not just going to let you make whatever you want about your, you know, pictures of cats. You're going to use this form that we built, template, okay, to make your disease. You can do it any way you want, but you got to do it the way I say. Um, we built an inter, uh, intermediary thing to the wiki page that essentially had them create the name of the disease, tag it, uh, and then when they, when they hit enter, it created a page with specific headers on it for the causes of the disease, the other biological systems the disease would have. And after that, they were free to add pictures, to talk about connections to Canada, to talk about all the things that creative high school students would do but it was a page about asthma, okay? And that's what period one did. They grabbed all the easy ones. Then period two came in and we said, hey, you know, keep going. And when you find a page that's not quite done, make it better. Uh, and, and if you didn't find emphysema in there, add emphysema. And as they went, they added a lot of pages. They made a lot of revisions. Period three and four and five started to get a little frustrated because it was all filling up. But honestly, by the end of one day, one class period, because we had those five sections editing it, we had a full wiki of all human diseases that all kids had touched on their expertise level. So we already knew we were onto something pretty cool here, and it wasn't just, you know, create a Pinterest board of your favorite stuff. It was really indexed to the learning goals of the course, and it was going to be used consequentially for the <coughs> curriculum. Okay, that's the whole point. Um, next. Let's create some inquiry activities that reflect emergent themes. And um, we came up with this one that was called medical challenge cases. So you, uh, what were your respiratory something? Make up a fictitious, a fictitious case of somebody sick with a disease. Don't say what that disease is. Just talk about its symptoms. Oh, please be creative too. Um, come up with something like um, Snow White and the Seven Smokers. Okay. And do two of those. And by the way, you don't realize this, but you're learning when you're doing that. Okay, you're learning about because you're also connecting it to other disease uh, symptoms uh, systems. Now, when you're all done with that, uh, go solve two circulatory and two digestive ones. One digestive one and one circulatory one. So we had them suddenly need to use the resource, and you're only supposed to use the wiki to do that. So not only are you kind of rehearsing your own disciplinary um, specialty, you're kind of now held against the communities. Um, expertise. Was there any oversight by the instructor before this step to make sure that the information on the wiki was accurate? Yeah, yeah, there was. So she was kind of walking the room, <laughs> watching, talking. Obviously, anytime you do a learning community, the teacher, I mentioned in the apprentice, the guide on the side is a personal bugaboo of mine. I think it's a destructive uh, terminology, and I think it's paralyzing to teachers. And I think when we tell them that, we're basically saying, you know, just stay out of the way and make things better, maybe. In a KCI script, the teacher has a clear role. In this case, she was more of a guide on the side. So I had to learn this sometime, didn't I? I was learning it back here. Um, in KCI, we script the role of the teacher to make it very clear what they're doing and when and how. We also give them digital 
you know, we weave their digital supports in as well. In this case, she was walking the room, looking at Wikipedias, and these kids were working on each other too. So this is why Wikipedia is probably the most uh, credible resource in the planet, uh, because it's constantly vetted and overturned and, uh, and reviewed and critiqued by those who are most knowledgeable or politically biased. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to track what had been changing, and we will actually can see, because with this dynamic adding of information, I can see my instructor can be really overwhelmed quickly. I just spent an hour on this, and now I'm over here, and then I come back, and now it's... Yeah. That she was doing backflips. I don't know. Um, <laughs> she's pretty good, but she, she... I've seen steam come out of her ears when she was overwhelmed. I mean, on this, she was like, this is awesome. They're just scaffolded. They're creating. They're, they're editing each other's stuff. They're all changes of track if she wanted it, but these are... This is an elite school, science school. Never work with any other kids besides that. That's my advice. Um, if you're a learning scientist, because you... You, uh, all the problems exist in behavior and challenging context, but I, I really need a lab setting to do this kind of work because no one's done this kind of work before. And I got enough problems just trying to, to theorize about it and make it all happen and study it. And so it was very helpful to have kids who would, you know, they would do this on paper if you needed them to. And they're, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a good culture to do the work in. Um, but, you know, those kind of things to the extent that this becomes uh, interesting to others who are applying it, they're going to run into some issues. Um, I'm going to have to keep going quickly because I'm watching my own time here. So there were learning gains on this uh, that we could actually uh, isolate the physiology component of the final exam, and we saw that we made a bang. The kids loved it. They all, Actually, they solved all the challenge cases. And these are these kids, but they also really liked it, and they loved being able to try to figure it out. Um, that was a that was a five day one. Just quickly, we did a, a full semester one the next year. This is Hedia Najafi. She's uh, working at University of Toronto right now. Um, she was asking things about whole course design, and you might have read the paper that I forwarded uh, about that class. But she basically asked, and uh, we set up again five sections of students. And I, in all of my ten years in Berkeley doing curriculum inquiry curriculum, we never ran anything that put five sections of a class in the same learning community. That, not that they're actually in the, the, I'd say it's more in the classes, the learning community, but the fact that we could run the same thing using all of those students as a resource was, uh, that was uh, an eye opener for me and it still is. Um, so we had three teachers this time. We actually made a new platform using Drupal, so probably in around 2010, 20, uh, no, 2009. We explicitly treated epistemology uh, we had them basically build a wiki of climate change issues. So I'm just going to show kind of an interesting design that we, uh, and I'm not, I'm going to have to kind of flip through these quick, but where we, we were trying to orient them to the epistemics of the community. So we began with kind of uh, reflecting and ice breaking around uh, Wikipedia. We had them do a library reference thing where they actually vetted each other's contributions. We talked a lot about it. It was. We're still making progress on how to break that ice. In fact, the DRK-12 that I am submitting today is, is going to target that icebreaker activity if we can uh, get it funded. Um, but an interesting thing that Hedia worked out was this idea of uh, using the sections again to uh, come up with the issues. So how do you let the community voice come in? What do they think are the issues? Let's let them go find the issues. So we started off in period one, section one, sorry, that just kind of put them in six table groups and had them start adding issues. And then table two, uh, period uh, section two came in and started adding more issues. Section three added more issues. And by then, all the issues were getting kind of jumbled up on these big, pe we actually use paper. Now we use, uh, we, now we use tablets and uh, phones. But then section four started piling them into section groups. And then by the time section five came along, we said, why don't you add them into Drupal as issues? So voila, using five periods in the same day, we were able to have the community gestalt its issues and use that as the kind of primary index for the entire course, okay, which then situated the, all of their inquiry around those issues. Um, we divided all of the kids across all the sections into those issues, and at that point started to give them these kind of uh, inquiry assignments where they were building a knowledge base that was connected to four cross-cutting themes, carbon, sinks and sources, greenhouse effect, energy circulation in the atmosphere and oceans, 
and scientific models. So all the issues were indexed to those. And then all the inquiry activities that kind of use those issues. I talked in the apprenticeship course today about needing to need. So part of the scripting on this is coming up with a way that you need to need their stuff. And we have to, so it's, it's jigsaw times, uh, times jigsaw. So we need to kind of coordinate you so that you're indexing yourself to all aspects of the knowledge base. And that's the design trick that we are up against as a, it's kind of instructional design really. Um, lots of inquiry uh, scaffolds for collecting student ideas. There was a culminating inquiry project that eventually they had to create a remediation plan for one or more of those issues and position that uh, within the Canadian biomes of their own country. And again, always scaffolding, always giving page headers, and after that you can do whatever you want, but you're gonna do this. And that's the accessible learning outcome, so now I can make sure that I've got a rubric that connects to the content on those sections. I can communicate with the students about what that rubric's gonna be, so they know what they're gonna, what's gonna be looked for. And again, speeding through this, but she can get her whole dissertation. She did a lot of analyses on you know, pre-post gains. Everyone's gonna learn if you do a whole course on something, right? Um, unless you really mess it up. But we, we learned, so that was actually re reassuring. We, didn't, we did no harm. Um, she looked at knowledge integration of the kind of content of the pages as the pages matured and of their, of their materials and basically did a whole lot of studying of the dimensions, the kind of editing uh, dynamics of kids building on each other's ideas, whether they were uh, editing other people's work or just inserting their own, whether a page became coherent over time. And so these were the kind of studies that we've done in the early goings. Now, more recently, what's come into our world and our life as researchers are these kind of new media, new technologies, digital and physical um, interactives. Uh, some of that's happening here, I know, um, and I cite that work. And around 2010, we started to get into this notion, I think partly because I, I'm friends with Pierre uh, Dillenberg and, and Frank Fisher of Smart Classrooms. There was a book published in 2010 by that name. These are not rooms that turn the lights off when you leave. Um, these are rooms that know who you are, where you're sitting. The walls, the furniture have embedded intelligence. There's a server, a big server somewhere in the behind the curtain that's listening and actually operating on your content that might be knowing who you're working with. These are rooms that are trying in their very best because the designers who made them to coordinate the activities within the room and to maybe even learn from what's happening in the room. That's a smart classroom. Okay, um, we got really into this and we started to think a lot about um, the different ways that, that students could interact and the ways that the physicality of their environment could participate in that. This is around that same activity system. Um, um, framing that I mentioned earlier. So as well, you know, coming in more lately was this idea of learning analytics that is essentially um, often applied in the context of big data where you're trying to, to get patterns uh, from that data, but it can be applied in the context more like a intelligent tutoring system of real-time analysis of student interactions or maybe even a process analysis of groups and how that group is doing and whether that group is on it, what uh, kind of doing what it's supposed to be doing, equity of participation or roles and this kind of thing. So we're, we're adding some of that in. Uh, it, in our work, so we had this, this uh, we had this scalable architecture for interactive learning that was, uh, that's been coming along through the years and continuously sort of, it's probably now in its fourth version right now. Anyone know about reactive programming? We, we've gone from kind of messaging architectures to uh, reactive uh, architectures, but it's a, one of the ways that we found with the with that architecture that we can make a lot of stuff happen that's really interesting is using intelligent agents. And these are basically little bots or software programs that are listening in, and in, in later technology space, we've been able to use more active forms of listening in. So I can, it can actually watch your document as you're typing. If you say, teacher, I need help, it can be an agent that's just looking for any time that's typed, and teacher gets a message to their their tablet. So there's there's program there's technology affordances in these architectures now that are coming out that allow us to do interesting things with intelligent agents. And these agents have APIs. 
and you can actually create families of them and they can talk to each other. Uh, you can create um, uh, agent-based, what we call emergent learning objects, where one agent is actually in charge of finding content and assembling it and representing it in more kind of high-level ways for the community to examine. So that's been happening. Uh, and I'm going to show you examples of our application of these things. Uh, and, and you could imagine that as a form of real-time learning analytics. So I'm arguing for that, and that's the title of my talk. So um, you see where my, where my thinking is. Just some uh, pictures of scalable architecture. This is actually in the XMPP days where we're actually actively messaging. Now, now with React Redux, you can. Uh, there's a whole different way of framing this. I haven't gotten uh, pictures of yet, but essentially, it has. It, it shows you that when people are doing things in a, a, a massively connected classroom, imagine Google Docs. You know, for everybody, times. Uh, uh, I don't know. Times uh, some factor. You could be updating something on your workstation, and a, a an aggregate visualization of all student work can be reflecting the combined contributions of all the people in the class. Uh, you can have things pushed back to you. Once you've submitted something, I could have an agent send you back something that's most related to what you just submitted. Um, I can connect you to peers based on what you just did. So all these kind of things are, are there in the sale architecture. We created uh, something that we called Sales Smart Space. This was an abstraction of a smart room. Basically said, I can make this, if I, if I bundle these things together, I can turn any room into a smart room or any space into a smart space. I just have to apply these and, and design that space with them. So I'll show you a couple. Um, we were given a room in this school. That's, uh, that's a really good thing to be given if you're working in a school because we needed uh, a messy space. We needed a space that we could put our projectors up, take them down, have tables and chairs moved around, have lots of uh, equipment, sometimes um, tangible and embodied stuff. So that the school was really, I mean, it's, uh, it was remarkable to get this. It was an old uh, library that they weren't using uh, at that time, so we were able to have this room. Um, the first one I'll tell you about it's called Physics Learning Across Context and Environment. So this was by Mike Tissenbaum. He's, uh, I'll show you his, his slide in a second. It was a 12-week high school physics uh, class run in two sections. There were a variety of contexts of learning, including classroom, home, and that smart room. I'm not going to be able to tell you the entire design of his 12-week physics curriculum, but suffice to say it was one of these elaborately designed KCI scripts that uh, that really were consuming a lot of time and energy, but they, they come off as a choreographed set of individual collaborative and collective work on community knowledge. In this case, the kids were submitting user contributed content about stuff that happened to them. So, you know, this kid threw a rubber ball at his brother's head and videotaped it, head bounced back, and he submitted that. He said, look, Newton's third law. <clears throat> and then they work on those, you know, content and they tag them with the principles of the course, and then they create physics problems based on those examples that link to that media, and then they solve those physics problems, and then they create derivative physics problems. And then those physics problems are used to talk about <coughs> patterns of solution, energy approach, um, vector, uh, vector approach, circular motion, the stuff that the teacher wanted to cover in this uh, 12th grade physics. So this is Mike Tissenbaum. He's now at um, postdocing at MIT <coughs> with the App Inventor, and he was asking the first. He was the first one to investigate the smart room. He helped me develop the Sales Smart Space, and uh, basically was really looking at these intelligent agents. And he did a lot of work thinking about the API, thinking about what an agent was, and using them in some non-trivial ways to prove concept, basically. So this one wasn't as much about new ways of teaching and learning physics as it was about the smart classroom and the, the agent architecture, although we still came up with a pretty good physics learning design. Some of the things he wanted to look at were, can I, can I understand how to respond to students based on where they are in the room? Can I help uh, connect their actions to other students within the room? Um, and how can I leverage ambient media in the room as, a, as an input into their thinking and learning? So for example, uh, and I'll show you a video here shortly, 
he would, you know, as you were working on, so what he had was, uh, I'm not sure if I have a slide on this. He basically had in the smart room that I'll show you four Hollywood videos at four different stations in the room. Okay, something about Mary, the A-team, um, Iron Man getting shot up in the air half a kilometer and falling down to the ground, Fast and the Furious where one car jumps over a ramp and the other car jumps over the same ramp after the first car but passes him in midair and lands in front of him. Can that happen? How can that happen? Something about Mary where the little dog drags him across the hardwood floor. So he pulled, he pulled 90 second clips from these Hollywood physics, put them on the screen and asked kids to solve them. But you're not just going to solve them that way. You're going to solve them using the knowledge base from all of the semester long stuff you've been doing, pulling, pulling down physics problems that are similar to those circumstances, populate, looking at the solutions of those problems, setting this up as a physics problem, and then solving it. And oh, by the way, you're going to see all four of these before we're done here with you. So you're going to start off on station A, but some agents are going to do some stuff to you, and you're going to end up at station C and keep take up from where they were. And then you're going to go to B, and finally you'll be the ones writing solutions for D. So all kids are going to see all, all the, the screens go. It's a mess. But it's a mess that worked because of the intelligence of the smart room, and that's what I'll show you. He used a lot of these ambient screens, so they would flash green when you were still working on your part, and they would flash to yellow when you were about ready to wrap, and red when you were done. That was kind of blinking at the front of the room. That's a Dillenberg sort of lantern concept, for those of you who know. There were a lot of tools in this, um, more than I can go into, um, but there were tools for the boards, for the groups at the board, we had a kind of a, made it into kind of a giant laptop. So a collaborative laptop. So there was a big, uh, there, everybody's tablet was wired into it so they could all add stuff to it in a little um, collaborative groupware. But there was a keyboard and a mouse pad. And so that station was a kind of a work group station that, that had stuff happening on the board. There was also a front board in the room that had aggregate representations and ambient representations of the whole class activity. There were also tablet tools and materials that kids used. Um, a variety of them that I'm not going to have time to go into all of it, but they were specifically trying to scaffold and make sure you had what you needed when you needed it. For example, when you're coming to station A, you might get a set of physics problems that were recommended based on the meta tags that the previous group had added to that video. Frictionless, Newton's uh, first law, um, horizontal motion in one plane, and then a bunch of physics problems were retrieved by agents and sent to you and all the other members of your group that you have to look through and decide if they could be relevant to that setting up that problem. And that's your job right now. That's on the tablet. No need for you to think. The thinking part's done here. The room is smart. You have what you need. Go. Uh, you're still talking and enjoying and thinking about the physics. You just don't have to, nor does the teacher, have to do the work to think about all those physics problems that might be relevant to that board. The agents figure that out. Based on what the ones before you decided were the right meta tags. Okay? Then once you've selected and, 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 and uh, chosen all the physics problems that you think are relevant, then the agent goes and gets all the equations that, that a previous group had attached to those physics problems and gives you all those equations. That's kind of how this goes. It's a little bit complicated to talk through. Um, I'm going to show you a video now, um, some of it. So this is when they're still in the classroom doing some of that prior work. This is actually when they're uh, using their tablets to decide whether certain principles are part of, the, are relative to this video. That's obviously the Fast and the Furious one. And they're not showing me the time stamp on my video, so. I'm just gonna run it till it stops being interesting. That's uh, that's that's when it that's when it switched them, and you can sort of see the room controlling where the kids go next. It was fascinating to watch that. Uh, that's the Iron Man, obviously being blasted through the air. Something about there. Yeah. There's the teacher. Just something with uh, 
screen, that's the ambient display at the front of the room. And some of the kind of representations, it's hard to see from the back there, I guess, but some of the, the representations that we were using on these giant uh, collaborative group boards. Yeah, how did Iron Man survive? Well, what they had to do was they had to start setting up assumptions. Oh, the A-Team one was the one where they're falling in a tank and the, the tank is blasting, has to blast its cannon to make the tank fall in on the whole um, That's enough on that one. I mentioned formalisms. With Mike, I began to work quite a bit on setting up ways of representing this. How, I just talked through it in, in five minutes, ten minutes. All words, okay? When Mike and I are designing it, so we started using different ways. This is actually a storyboard way. This is actually a pictorial description of the, the various settings and st stages in the script. Only one of them, This imagine this is going on for 50 feet, um, of a kind of a, a pictorial narrative of that with different layers of description. This is the agent layer. This is the pedagogical layer. This is actually a social layer that we added in where people, where those of us in the group, including the teacher, are adding and responding to each other's comments about that design layer. Coming off of that, we started working with uh, universal markup language and showing these as kind of um, almost linking to the software uh, and how this would actually be depicted in terms of the various flows of information and uh, grouping and activity assignments. Um, I had Mike trying to work on a symbolic representation in a, in a more of a flow charty way, such that I could share it and discuss it. Uh, this is one, I think this is the part of the flow chart just for that <coughs> room. Again, this was a 12 week curriculum. Uh, so, that these little clouds are the agents doing their thing. Anyway, that's a, uh, suffice to say that that work was, uh, I think it was a little pioneering in the sense of the way that we were treating the room, the way that we were thinking about the agents, and the way that we were deeply connecting that work to a pedagogical model for making sure that you were learning and on task and yet engaged and the teacher was still, uh, in that case, uh, highly scripted. The teacher had a tablet that was calling him over to certain stations when he was needed and had uh, representations of the different um, stations. Next, next one up. Uh, anyone know Tom Moore and his work at uh, University of Illinois? Of course. Um, Tom's a computer scientist. He had, and I'm going to not do his work enough justice with the speed of this, but he has a brilliant idea called embedded phenomena. Um, and it was perfectly situated for KCI, perfectly suited. Um, embedded phenomena are digital phenomena that you sort of permeate the room with. <coughs> the walls, the floor, the ceiling, the furniture. Okay? But you can't see them. Okay? So he has one called Room Quake, where there's actually imaginary fault lines. These are for elementary science. Imaginary fault lines under the floor and a big subwoofer back here under the teacher's desk. And he puts three seismograms, uh, digital uh, seismograms, around the room. And then, and his idea is that science is happening all the time, 24-7, and that's how science is. And he wants kids, so there's a bit of a nature of science in this. And then all of a sudden, you'll hear this kind of Kids will get excited, but you're in the middle of something. So teacher says, you know, I heard it too. It'll that was a quake. You know, we'll when we get to science, we'll go look at the seismograms, find the one, find where it was, and then we'll use three of them and triangulate where the quake was. And then from the ceiling, we'll hang uh, these balls that are the size of the quake. And then over the entire semester, we will find out where the fault lines were in under the room. Okay, the one I'll talk to you about is called Walkology. Oh, and so the kids work as a knowledge community there. That can't be done by one kid. These are happening, these are a kind of a collective effort, right? He had another one called Walkology that was really well suited. We won a cyber learning grant to, to look at this, um, where he imagined all the walls of the room are full of digital insects. Imaginary, but real. Um, you can't see them unless I put, you know, one of these wall scopes on the wall, and then that shows you a kind of an x ray view that shows water pipes and heating pipes and all the creatures. They all have life cycles, they all have food webs, predator-prey relations, and we're not going to tell you anything else. Go. Okay, so the community has to figure this out. What is the food web? What are the life cycles? Um, just, this is an older version of it, but this is the kind of thing the kids would see. They would have to develop their own ways of understanding, thinking, and learning about this. 
and you can imagine like you know there's some eggs there and there's probably hatchings that it, here's a hatching there it mm -hmm. happens there's like there's uh, morphologies of different creatures some of them like the pipe some of them don't Rebecca Kober, uh, now working in Michigan uh, University, did her doctorate on this where she was looking at aggregate representations. So she said, how do I, if I'm a teacher, help the class make progress on all of their investigations of these? We put a, we put a wall scope on each wall. We also varied the walls in terms of temperature and humidity. Then we would actually mess with the walls. We introduced a predator, uh, uh, invasive species, and the other wall we had climate uh, change, uh, where it's temperature was going up, and the other one we had habitat uh, loss. So these were kind of connected to real issues, and this was our KCI curriculum, substantive uh, curriculum design that Rebecca helped me uh, create. <coughs> but how do I support the teacher in helping the class make progress on that, okay? So her study was on uh, collective knowledge and representations of collective knowledge. If I'm a kid and I see, for example, let's look at life cycle, I see this blue egg turn into this green critter. I think I see that. I thought I saw that. Can't rewind it, it's nature, okay? But I give the kid, a, now, so this is where my group comes in. Besides the KCI design of the curriculum and the pedagogy, we also created all the tools and the, the, the smart environment for helping this community make progress on understanding this ecosystem in their room. And the kids loved it, by the way. No problem believing it, suspended disbelief to the extreme. They were arguing about, should we keep the heat on when we leave for Christmas? <laughs> and they knew this, they knew this, but they didn't care. They were like, they were right there with it. Um, and he told me that was true, and I, I saw it and believed it. Again, a lab school. Um, so we built a tool that said, okay, just drag that egg down here and drag that thingy down here and hit enter. You're done. Your work is done here. Go look some more. But, Teacher, I don't know how to just go, because then we're going to show you at the front of the room, the teacher can pull up a smart board that's tracking everybody's observations about what turned into this green thing. And look, I see 20 of us said this egg turned into this green thing. Two of you said this thing did. You know, eight of you said it turned into itself. That's all right. Um, what do we think now as a class? Do we think blue thing turned into green thing? What if eight of us said one thing and 10 of us said another? Oh no, hell horror, we have a scientific problem that we can now address as a community. We have contention. How can we solve that? Well, now we have an opportunity for nature of science and who's gonna get on this? Now we have an opportunity for a small group to take that on. And this is the role of these aggregate representations in, a, in allowing for, in affording new forms of discourse around the scientific community and the efforts and progress of the scientific community. And that was uh, Rebecca's uh, doctorate. I'll just show you a little picture of what this looked like because it's really cool. Um, let's see. It, it, you know, fundamental to me is butts out of chairs in this. I didn't want to see what I'm seeing here. Um, and none of us do, right? We all want to see how do we get these kids really working within their physical space around deep ideas um, engaged in the inquiry in their room, uh, discursive around the science, with the teacher playing a meaningful role to help those reflections. And how do we use <coughs> representations of their progress to allow that to kind of to feed into that that work? So the two teachers were amazing. Uh, the classes were noisy but focused. So there's all kinds of different media involved, tablets, obviously, for uh, making their observations, the wall scopes, the smart boards. Uh, there was actually a considerable amount of paper involved. Uh, kids were often left to come up with their own ways of, this is a knowledge building school, this is where Marlene Scardamalia, Carl Breiter did all of their work. So these kids know a lot about building knowledge together, which is a helpful um, thing to have if you're doing this kind of work. That's enough of a look at that. So this is all giving you a flavor of the work that I'm doing. I'm looking at my time. Um, and Rebecca did a, a whole analysis of the kinds of discourse that was happening in this room, uh, the, the role the teacher played. You see some of these kind of, uh, we built some new environments for supporting uh, student observations and teacher discussion around those. Um, 
the last example I'll just have to show you kind of a quick visual on is Evo Room. So Evo Room is a whole other take on all of this, uh, as if I can't possibly have another whole other take. I actually have two more whole other takes. But this is one where I'm going to put you inside a simulation. Okay. Well, that is a little bit similar to Wallcology because it, it's around you. But here's one where I had an artist for a student who was trained as a medical illustrator and a flash expert. And she wanted to use a, um, in Toronto they have this, you know, well, she wanted to use a lot of projectors and she wanted to turn the room into a sort of a cave, okay? She designed a rainforest and she engaged the community of the students. These are 12th, uh, sorry, 10th grade biology. The class was on evolution and, bio and uh, biodiversity. These are hotshot kids. So she, she told them that they're gonna be working with a web designer, which was her, to make a rainforest in Sumatra that evolved over 200 million years. She gave them specialty assignments, so they had a, a time that they were specialized in 200 million years ago, 150, 100, 75, 50, 25, five, two, and one. There were eight of them. So you're specializing on that area, and then within that you had specializations on uh, flora, fauna, um, uh, insects, different kinds of creatures. They were supposed to grab the knowledge of what was around in that rainforest and what descended from what and populate a knowledge base about that. She was busy rendering that all as creatures um, in, in this rainforest and rendering the rainforest at these eight different time periods. Then they all went in the room and the teacher advanced the room from one time period to the next and the kids all had tablets that were guiding them to make observations and collect descendancy relations and biodiversity observations about the rainforest as it evolved through time. Sound complicated? Um, you know, two years of design studies, uh, design meetings, and uh, Michelle Louis, who's currently a postdoc at uh, Illinois with Tom, was looking at questions like how can these room size simulations support inquiry? There's a picture of her rendering of the room. At the front is this aggregate of student ideas. And I just want to make sure I leave enough room, so I'm going to just close with a video of it and probably have to end there. So this is the Evo room. And again, I'm just looking at bodies in motion. I'm thinking about engagement. I'm thinking if the, the media and the design interactions are doing what they're supposed to do, which is U3, thinking about evolution and biodiversity while in a rainforest. And also it's cool. How do I get my, the other one's all worked. So we kind of get a, a gestalt here of what it looks like in this room. Um, a lot of activity, a lot of it driven by what's being asked of you on your tablet. The front of the room is this kind of collective uh, visualization. I'm sorry, the screens are a little washed out, but basically at each time period, they're kind of collecting observations about what whether a species is present and if it's not whether what species was its ancestor in that time the teacher is also helping I think in this case I can't remember what the teacher's exact role was but you also had specialists at each time period who were then the mentors and the docents for that time period. So when it was 150 million years, you were on, and that was yours, you were on stage to walk around and help them understand the different species. Okay. Uh, just looking at some of the tools here, the media. You can see at the front of the room there, they're starting to show up these kind of large, what they ended up with in the end, after all their observations, was a collective cladogram of the descendancy relations. This is actually the biodiversity part, so these are kind of more notes about different stations. But again, because of time, I guess I'm really going to have to redu reduce this to just giving you a sense of the discourse, the role of media, the fact that we wired this into, as a teacher using the front more, we wired this into a room. We had heavy presence of agents doing work, sending you materials, assignments, connecting you to peers, and creating emergent representations of student ideas. Um, yeah, then we did that in a movie. 
which I won't be able to talk to you about. That's Dion Hoppe, who's in, who's working with Pierre right now, building another MOOC. And uh, we did some technology there that Dan knows a little bit about. But this overall progression is one of, for me, thinking about collective inquiry, formalizing it, coming up with a model about it, applying it, and then mashing that up with technology and media to help make it all go better. Uh, and uh, that's got to be the end of what I can talk about now. I'm, I'm moving this into undergraduate learning in science, and that's what we're writing grants about now. I'm trying to build a group in Boston. Um, questions? Thank you oh. so much. Oh. I, I like a little pause. <laughs>